What's up, everybody? Gerard here, as always, with your three T Podcast official YouTube channel. It's Wednesday, and as always, that means our Raw SmackDown quick take reviews. The good, the bad, and the ugly of WWE programming this week. It's our post Class of Champions episode, so here's my rating, as well as match at night for Class of Champions. 7.5 out of 10. I thought it was a pretty solid show. Held my interest throughout for the most part. Match of the night was Kofi versus Orton. Very happy that Kofi picked up the dub. It solidifies him as a main event player. One, solidifies his title reign. Two, and three, and most importantly, he gets over the biggest roadblock of his entire career. That's why that was my match of the night, and it's probably my favorite feud in WWE in the last couple months. Now, until the quick take review portions, the ugly, the continuation of Lacey Evans and the Natalia feud. While Lacey Evans looked very impressive on Raw, it really didn't deliver much for me. Other than the shotgun drop kick thing where she did it over the ropes to the apron. Yeah, that's great. But no one cares about the Natalia feud. And I think on the audience, both live crowd, viewers at home, and on the internet aren't into this feud. And they're not going to be in the feud at all. Secondly, and probably worse than that, is it the continuation of the Kevin Owens, Shane McMahon storyline. This is more of a personal opinion here. I don't think a rivalry should be hinting towards a second Hell in the Cell match in as many years or in three years. It's not really a blood feud to me. It's like the evil boss versus the baby face that we've seen countless times in WWE. And in pro wrestling in general, it's a constant trope that companies use to get some guys over. I thought this feud ran its course already, right? Everyone thought it was at its conclusion. And now it's just like, no, nah, we're going to go back to it. And there's going to be a lawsuit. Lawsuit angle. Whack. Outside of that, there's nothing really extremely horrible. Now, for my bad portion, didn't like that. The whole Carmella thing with Bailey and Sasha and Charlotte. Why is she being included in this? I understand that she's a real life friend of Bailey's, and they kind of mentioned it on NXT a couple times, maybe on SmackDown once or twice. But yeah, no, it's what should have happened, in my opinion, is that they could have just continued that with them having a 2 on 1 beatdown of Charlotte. And then it's like, why didn't Becky come out? I'm sure it's still going to be brought up, why didn't Becky come out? But still. It's one of those things that didn't really make sense to me. The crowd looked look kind of confused for the most part. Yeah. No, also from the Raw side of things for the bad, didn't like Braun Strowman destroying and attacking both, both shows tag team champions. The tag team division kind of takes a, a bunch of lumps in WWE constantly for the most part. Other than the New Day and the Usos, other tag teams are kind of either thrown together or shuffled around and they're not really made to look like serious threats. So one man beating up four guys, and all four guys looking scared when this one guy is coming out to the ring. Doesn't play well. I get it. It's trying to keep Braun Strowman as this monster, but the monster thing is wearing off due to him not being able to win a world title match, no matter who he's fighting, whatever the circumstances are. Right? And I think it's gonna it's hurt him now, and it's going to hurt him even further on into his career. But aside from that, those four things... I think this was awesome shows throughout. So let me jump right into the cool crap. The very good. Which I thought was very good on Raw and SmackDown this week. First, we're going to start off The Fiend. Bray Wyatt made his presence felt throughout the episode of Raw. Throughout. I think he had about seven Firefly Funhouse segments. One with Ramblin' Rabbit telling Seth to run. Which Bray Wyatt made to scare him off. I'm very interested where that's going. I feel like this is an angle that's going to play out a little bit more on the show itself. Where Ramblin' Rabbit is the leaker or the exposer of what the Fly for Flying House really is. Yeah, I have no clue where they're going with it, but it's very interesting. And then he had more segments where he mentioned his friends, a.k.a. Finn Balor, Jerry Lawler, etc. Victims of his assaults. And then he says he needs to make more, more friends. Right? Then I'm going to segue this quick into the 24 7 stuff, which had Mayor Glenn Jacobs, aka the Big Red Machine Kane, defeating R Truth for the title and then losing it on Raw as they arrived to the arena. Pretty hilarious. I think Kane's one of those guys, he's able to do the monster heel stuff and then have this comedy thing on the side sometimes, and it works very well for him. R Truth is gold as always. I think he's a 17 time 24 7 champion, so he's beating Ric Flair's record, so to speak. 
And then uh, since I segue that, we're going to segue back into the end of the show, which had Seth Rollins versus the tag team champion Bobby Roode. Seth goes over, Ziggler jumps in, two on one assault. The OC comes down for whatever reason, and they're beating up on Seth. Also, it's like a five on one beatdown. Commentary is like, who's going to stop this? Who could stop this? <sighs> Kane comes out. Crowd pops big because he's the mayor of Knoxville, Tennessee, and they're in Knoxville, Tennessee. He runs through the heels. He's about to do his whole classic fire thing. But then the lights go off. The Fiend stuff comes out. The Fiend's behind Kane. Puts him in the mandible claw. Chokes him out. Stares o- crawls over to Seth. And stares him down again. And Seth looking terrified his life. I, Seth's not really good at selling things to me. But he did an outstanding job selling his fear and his vulnerability right now to the Fiend Bray Wyatt. And then they closed with Bray Wyatt laughing through the mask and all that. And then they aired like a big Firefly Funhouse segment that went through the show, kind of. Right? And it's something that went on for the last two minutes or a minute and a half of the broadcast. The screen flipped upside down. A lot of things. The theme song nah, 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 kept going. Weird breaks and glitches in between. Very intriguing to see where they go with this. I think it's imperative that The Fiend beats Seth because it, too, it hurts Seth as in the audience perception that he's the new Cena at this point, right? So if he beats The Fiend, it kind of solidifies his run as that like 2011, 2012 Cena where Cena beat every heel, every cool thing that was going on. Cena reclaimed it, overcame it, and beat them. I think Seth's bordering on that territory, so him beating The Fiend would further split the audience in their perception of Seth Rollins. The Fiend is very hot right now. You got Strike by the Irons hot. And I know my co-host, Lil Rice Crispy, has more of an opposite opinion, thinking they could slow, should slow burn this more. Let me know in the comments what you think. Should The Fiend Bray Wyatt be challenger for the title now? Yeah, if yes, tell me why. And if no, tell me why. Right? One question I'll pose in the audience. Now, after that, well, before that, you had The Fiend the King of the Ring Finals. Great tournament, actually. Well, the tournament was outstanding throughout. Ch- Chad Gable versus Baron Corbin. Baron Corbin becomes King Corbin, King Applebee's manager. Well, he's not really a manager now. He's like a regional owner, supervisor. Maybe he brought a couple of Applebee's on the way. But yeah, he's taken over. Awesome match. Phenomenal match. Best match of both nights to me. And it was kind of puzzling that people are still like anti-Corbin. Like, go away heat is still good heat. And he's proven that hit the whole sentiment was that he's not a good worker. This entire King of the Ring tournament has had the best matches throughout the tournament with multiple guys, right? The Miz, he had a great match with Ricochet and Joe. He had a great match with Gable. And the guy can go. He's a good heel. This win gives him another career accolade. He's slowly building up a pretty good resume, right? U.S. champion, Money in the Bank winner. Andre the Giant Battle Royal winner, King of the Ring winner, retiring of Kurt Angle. He's slowly building a pretty good resume. And I think they also help, it helps Chad Gable, which is more important because Chad Gable, while he's a great performer and he's very underrated, the crowd really doesn't pay him much mind. One, because he's not on a lot, and when he was, he's a tag team guy and they don't put an emphasis on the tag team division. So he doesn't really have that spotlight on him. And between that and then the coronation segment on SmackDown where he belittled his height and pretty much belittled his height to the point where it's like, okay, we get he's short and now you're just being an ass about it, right? And the crowd got behind it. And then Gable gives him the beat down, destroys the entire King of the Ring set, rips up the robe, stomps the crown, crowd goes nuts. I hope this could be sustainable for Chad Gable. I think Corbin's going to be on to bigger, brighter things after his feud with Gable. He might be a sleeper to win one of those big titles, even if it's a mid-card title, at some point this year. Now, to me, from both shows, what stand out is on SmackDown, the beginning of SmackDown, after their New Day versus the Revival in Aura in the six-man tag, which was a great match, by the way. You should also check that out. Brock Lesnar's music hits, and Brock Lesnar comes down to the ring. Beard, more hair. Looking similar to what he did in his UFC run with the beard growing in. He came out. Paul Heyman pretty much says, you have to fight Brock. Brock's challenging you for the title. 
what I thought before that, what was really cool too, Kofi kind of said to Biggie and Woods, I got this, you guys could leave. It kind of solidifies Kofi has this very strong willed, determined baby face. One of the best baby faces in wrestling right now. Even outside of WWE, he's one of the best baby faces in the world right now. Kofi obviously accepts the challenge. Brock goes in for the handshake. At five. The best part is this is gonna be on the debut episode of SmackDown on Fox. I think it's Friday, October third. That'll be the first main event for the WWE title. It's Brock's first match on SmackDown in 15 years. And it's it's gonna be able to start off Fox with a bang with a great title match. I'm expecting a great match. I think this is where Kofi's seventh month long title reign comes to an end. I think Brock wins. Now for the ratings, right? We're gonna give both shows an eight. I tell give Raw. I'm gonna give Raw a seven out of ten here. The Fiend really stole the show, but there were some things that kind of lacked outside of that. SmackDown was strong, eight out of ten, very solid shows. Even the seven is a good rating, right? Awesome shows this week. I think they're building a lot more momentum as we're going into the the network changes and the draft and all that. By the way, the draft's coming up. Who do you would you like to see go to Raw, SmackDown, or even NXT? Right? So awesome show this week. It's starting to build to help us have one or more eventful pay-per-views of the year due to the, the name and match of the namesake of the pay-per-view Helm Cell. So that's all, right? Like, comment, subscribe. All our links to our social medias below, our Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram accounts. If you want me to tell you, I Strong Style and through the Table on Instagram. Check us out for your memes and wrestling news needs. We're on the Wrestle Post app, which is the great directory for professional wrestling. We're also on Pro Wrestling Tees. If you want to buy our merchandise, we have two t-shirts on there. Check us out on there. Buy a shirt. And if you want to listen to the podcast, you're tired of seeing my face weekly. You just want to listen to me and the Rice Krispies voice. We're on Spotify, iTunes, TuneIn Radio, and Google Play. And this is Gerard from The Three. T. Crew signing off until next week.